Welcome to Power Today with internationally acclaimed pastor and evangelist, Brother R. W. Shambach. From tent revivals in America's urban centers to major venues around the world, Brother R. W. Shambach touches millions of lives daily with his message of hope, proclaiming the saving, healing power of Christ. And now, with over 50 years of dynamic ministry service, he is bringing this life-changing gospel into your home. This is Power Today with Brother R. W. Shambach. I want to read something to you from the book of Acts. At the very beginning of the book, it says the Acts of the Apostles. I like to change one word. It's the Acts of the Holy Ghost. This is the only book in the Bible that has not ended. There has no ending to it. Because that means the Holy Ghost is still acting. And he's still performing the miraculous and the supernatural. I want to read from the third chapter of the book of Acts. First verse. If you have your Bible, you can follow me, but listen as I read it. Now, Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer. Now, that's the first miracle. They were praying. That's how Pentecost started. Being the ninth hour, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they had laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask for alms. Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us! And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. He didn't know what he was going to receive, but I, I, I underlined the word, he expected. He was expecting to receive something. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give thee, or give I thee, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength and he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple walking and leaping and praising God they broke up a prayer meeting I'd like to see some more prayer meetings broken up And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. I would like to suggest in your devotional time, read the first five, six chapters of this, and you will see how miracles played a very important part in the establishment of the church. In the third, in the fourth chapter, let me just read a little from this. Verse number 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, I believe we need a revival of boldness. I'd like to see God's people get bold and not be ashamed of what they believe and let people know that it's for today just like it was 2,000 years ago. 
When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. What a testimony. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle which hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. He's doing it again. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. They called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, ye judge, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and we have heard. Bow your hearts and let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the reading of the Holy Scriptures. The anointing of God is already here. You can sense it when you walk into this auditorium. That anointing destroys every yoke. People are here from all over. Many of them are here for a miracle. Physically, some spiritually, some in their family relationship, some in their mind. Some need to be delivered from demon forces. And they've come not only to hear the word, but they've come to see God perform a miracle in their life. Lord, I've been praying that this be the night. Don't allow one soul to leave this place disappointed. But let them leave here tonight singing a new song. I got just what I wanted from the Lord. And everybody said amen, amen. and amen. Many of you, I'm not going to go into the whole thing, but many of you have heard me tell the story, especially on TBN of the greatest miracle that I ever witnessed was in A.A. A. Allen's meeting. A lot of people, when I tell that, they come to me, it's church folks. They said, did that really happen? I said, uh, no, I'm just telling a lie. Sinners will believe what you say. But it's church folks that don't believe it. Where be all your miracles? When we were in Birmingham, Alabama, I'll never forget it. I'll just paraphrase it. A mother from Knoxville, Tennessee came to Birmingham, Alabama with her little son, four years of age, that was born with 26 major diseases. He was born blind and deaf and dumb, and his tongue hanged out of his mouth. Lay on his chin. He had deformed lungs, deformed liver, deformed heart. Only two and a half chambers were functioning in the heart. He had no business to be alive. And she told me, she said, Brother Shambach, I preached the afternoon service. We called that the faith clinic to get him ready for the operating table tonight. Many of you need an operation tonight. 
And I've been praying about this. Let me go on just a little bit more about the story. But she came to me, and in my spirit, I said, If God kept this boy alive four years, then he must be going to do something for him. Because the doctors told her that that boy would never see his first birthday. And he's approaching four. Both arms were deformed, matted together, elbows protruding up into the stomach, both legs deformed, the knees touching the elbows. He was in a fetal position. Expecting that child to die any moment. He was born without male organs. And he was born without feet. Twenty-six major diseases. That woman stayed for a week, like some of you are going to do here. Don't go home early. You don't know what's coming. That woman stayed for a week. She lived in a motel ate three restaurant meals. She gave in every service. We had three services a day. And she came to me the following Sunday after I got done preaching, and she said, is the man of God going to pray for my son? I said, I don't know. Because God used him in a supernatural way where he sees things. And he'd always take you on a trip. Halfway through his message, he was stopping. He said, uh, God is taking me on a trip. And I, I told her, I said, now, I don't know whether he's going to pray, but I'll tell you this one thing. If he does not pray, now, she told me, she said, I, I ain't got but $20 left. $15 is for the doctor. $5 is for gas to get me from Birmingham back to Knoxville, and you know that must have been years ago when gas was only 15 cents a gallon. Some of you young folks, you, you can't conceive that. But that's when it was cheap. And she said, all I have left is $20, and you ain't going to see no doctor for $15. And she said, i got to take him back. Do you believe he's going to pray? And I said, I don't know, but I will tell you this one thing. If he does not pray for your child tonight, I will personally take that baby to the man of God's trailer house. We all lived in trailers. And I'll get him to lay hands on that boy before you go home. She said, you'll do that? I said, I'll do it. She went back to her seat. Got in the service that night. I introduced the man of God. He come flying out there. And he said, I believe God's going to do great things tonight. He said, but before we do this, I'm going to take an offering. Doesn't that sound familiar? I hope you all obeyed God tonight when Pastor Parsley asked you to do something. Because that's what triggers many a miracle. It did in this case. And she said, all I have left is $20. And he come out and he said, I believe God's going to do great things tonight. But he said, before I preach, I want you to give God an offering of faith. And I never heard him use that terminology before this. And he said, now, if you don't know what I mean, an offering of faith is giving God something you can't afford. If you can afford it, there's no faith connected to it. And I saw that little woman throw that little baby into the arms of another woman. And he leaped, at, she leaped out into the aisle and came running. He was holding the offering buckets. We were in the fairgrounds auditorium there. I'll never forget this. And she came running down there and threw an offering into the bucket. She was three quarters of the way back and she was the first one to the bucket. I leaped off the platform and I went down and looked in the bucket because I'm nosy. I know what the woman had because she told me that afternoon. And 
when I looked in that bucket, I saw a $20 bill. I ran behind the platform and I wept like a baby. And I cried out to God and I said, oh God, I've been trying to teach faith to this woman all week. But I said, please, Jesus, give me faith like I saw that woman manifest tonight. I don't know whether I could have done that. And you don't know whether you could do it unless you're in a similar situation. I jumped back on the platform, and he started to preach. He was into his message about 10 minutes, and he said, I'm being carried away in the Spirit. I said, oh, no. Here we go on another trip. <laughs> and all I have on my mind is that baby boy. And he says, I'm coming up on a white building. Oh, I know it. It's a hospital. I'm on the inside now, and I hear a lot of babies crying. It's the maternity ward. He said, a little baby was just born. And there's four or five doctors around the table. And I hear one of the doctors saying, the baby won't live to see its first birthday. He said, the baby was born with, this is Brother Allen talking, the baby was born with 12, 16, 20, 26 major diseases. I come alive. I said, my God, tonight's that baby's night. He said, the doctors are wrong. The boy's alive. And he said, I see the mother getting into an old Ford, packing a suitcase, another lady with her. And he said, I see the Tennessee, Alabama border. He said, that old Ford's pulling into the parking lot. He said, lady, you're here tonight. Bring me your baby now. God is going to give you 26 miracles. Nobody told me this story. I was there. I was an eyewitness to it. And she came and put that baby in his arms. Mama was standing over there the end of the platform he paced back and forth he said I want everybody to stand close your eyes I'm standing with him pacing with him I said I ain't closing my eyes I said I've been waiting for this all week I'm going to be scriptural I'm going to watch and pray <laughs> Darlene Bishop you know what I'm talking about don't you I'm going to watch and pray and I watched, and the first thing I saw, those blind eyes, a milky color, whirlpools began to spin around, and all of a sudden, the whirlpool was gone, and I was looking into the eyes of a brown-eyed baby boy. The blind eyes opened. I knew if God opened the eyes, I knew them deaf ears popped. And all of a sudden, the next thing, the arms started cracking and popping like cordwood and both arms came out both legs simultaneously with the arms began to snap and brought both of those legs out remember the boy was born without feet and born without male organs but here all of a sudden and I saw this with my own eyes. God created feet on the little boy that had no feet.
What do you want God to do for you? I've been hearing that ever since I got here. What do you want? Not what you need. What you want? What do you want? What do you want? Uh, anything he wants to give me. I'm tired of that mess. What do you want? Jesus on the main line? Tell him what you want. I said, tell him what you want. Hallelujah. You're going to leave here. Ah, oh, you're going to leave here a different person tonight. This is your night to receive a miracle from God. Hallelujah. A little while ago, you told somebody, I believe you're going to get a miracle. Turn around that same person and say, uh uh. I'm the one going to get the miracle tonight. That's what I'm here for. I'm believing God for myself. I'm going to claim this for myself. Oh, hallelujah. 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 I cannot deny God's power. Brother Allen put that boy down on his brand new feet. No shoes. You don't put shoes on clubs. He had no shoes. Barefoot. Never saw his mama. Never talked. The tongue snapped back into his mouth for the first time. And he started taking off and running to mama. And I'm running right on this trail. And he leaped into his mama's arms and I heard him say his first words, Dwight. He said, Mama! Oh, I'm telling you something, folks. That was the greatest night that I believe I was in because that precipitated other miracles. Twelve wheelchairs on that side. Twelve wheelchairs. And when you see wheelchairs, a lot of them are motorcycle accident victims. Broken backs and hips. No hope. On that side were 15 stretchers they brought in from the hospital. All of a sudden, when they saw that miracle of that little boy, everybody in the wheelchairs... Nobody laid hands on them. But all of them got up like a master sergeant commanded them to rise up. And they come out of the wheelchairs totally healed by the power of the living Christ. Every eye left the wheelchairs and every eye went to the stretchers. Anticipation set in. God never disappointed them. Nobody laid hands on them. No human hands. And everybody in those stretchers got up and walked out. Totally healed by the power of the Christ. Ah, a notable miracle has taken place. One of the greatest, I believe, that I've ever seen. And it was precipitated by a $20 offer. That's all she had. You can't buy a miracle for $20. The man of God said, give God an offering of faith. I hope you all did what God told you to do. And this man of God talked about them phone calls. Because when you give, you precipitate an offer. I mean, you participate, precipitate a miracle that's coming your way, especially if you're obedient to God. Now, that woman wrote me a letter. And this will top it all. She went to Knoxville, and she said, I would have walked home just to get a new baby. I would have walked home, but she said, I didn't have to walk, Brother Shamrock. She sent me the letter. She said, but you and that preacher left early that night. And I'm standing there, and he, she said, a little woman came and shook my hand. She was so happy for what God did for me. And she said, there was a folded piece of paper between the palms. 
And she said she left it in my palm. And she said, I'm so glad for you. And she looked in her palm and there was a $20 bill. And other people began to line up. And everybody that shook her hand had the same sensation between the palms. And they come by so fast, she said, I just opened my purse, Brother Shambach, and said, glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. <laughs> hey! What do you want? She said, Brother Shambach, I went in the ladies' room and counted all that money. She said, and I counted it. She told me what it was. And she said, isn't it just like Jesus? She said, I ate in three restaurants every day. Gave in three offerings every day. Paid the hotel bill. She said, God sent me home with more money than what I came with. And I'll never forget her P.S. P.S. Brother Shambach, you can't beat God giving. No matter how much you try. I stole that from her, Perky. I made a book out of it. You just can't beat God giving no matter how much you try. Can you take another offering? Uh, maybe some of you missed the first one. And you didn't obey God. And you may have to come down here and turn it loose. I ain't taking no offering. But I, I come here to preach. I didn't get started yet. Last year I got cheated out of. Well, I'm going to make up for it tonight. It's only five after eight. In Tyler, Texas. Brother Parsi always says, make yourself at home. <laughs> I'm going to make myself at home. What do you want God to do for you? Just what do you want? Tell three people what you want. Go ahead now. Tell it. the 11th chapter of Daniel, just a portion of verse 32. Listen carefully, the latter part. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. It's going to take me several days to finish this, you that are listening by means of radio, but you that are under the tent, possibly it will take me two nights to complete it in its entirety. 
But I want to speak to you on this particular theme, the prerequisites for personal power. I like the word power. This broadcast is called the voice of power. Paul said, in my preaching, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but with the demonstration of the Spirit of God and with power that your faith should not stand in the intellect or in the wisdom of men, but that your faith might stand in the power of God. But I'm going to bring this a little closer to home and make it personal for every one of you. We are always looking to a man or to a woman for the power that they have claimed. But I want to challenge you that every one of you as a believer, you have the power of God in your life. I'm talking about personal power. I'm talking to the church tonight. I'm talking to you who are washed in the blood of the Lamb. You that are sanctified. You that have been filled with the Holy Ghost. You have received power. But there are certain prerequisites, and I'm using this particular text from the book of Daniel because I believe that this is one of the key points in the church today. Paul, writing to the church at Ephesus, he says, Finally, my brethren, in the sixth chapter, be strong in the law and in the power of his might. Now, all you got to do is look at your own life and you can understand already that we're powerless. You don't have to holler amen if you don't want to, but it's truth anyhow. You don't have to look at the church. All you got to look at your own life. We are in a mess. And this is the condition that the church is in. And I believe the reason why the church is in this in condition is because Daniel hits it on the head. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. The reason why there's no power in the life of the church and no power in the believer is because we do not know Him. We know about Him, but we don't know Him. Power stems from knowledge. Why, our church is so messed up, some people don't even know whether they're saved or not. Don't turn the radio off. Keep it on. And I believe this is the whole crux of the matter right here. Because we do not know. Our knowledge is limited. But I believe there comes a time in the life of a believer that we ought to know who we are. Can you shout amen with me, somebody? Ask some Christians, are you saying, well, I hope so. I'm living all I know how. Did you ever hear this? But I believe that you can know that you are a child of God. His Spirit will bear witness with your spirit that you are a son of God. If you're depending on somebody telling you you're saved, you don't have it. It was right here in Seattle some years ago. Some young people came to me and they said, Hey, preacher... Am I saved? I said, no. You don't know me. I said, I don't have to know you. When you get saved, you won't have to go around asking somebody, am I? You'll be going around saying, I am saved. Because you're going to know it without a shadow of a doubt. Can you shout praise the Lord with me, somebody? St. John's Gospel, to know him whom to know right is eternal life. You can know him right, or you can know him wrong. But here Daniel, way back in the Old Testament, breaking the people, the people that do know their God shall be strong, and they shall do exploits. 
Now I want you to check up on your own life here. Now stop looking at somebody else's. Look at your own life. What kind of exploits have you done? The Bible said these signs shall follow them that believe. It doesn't say these signs will follow the preacher, the pastor, or the evangelist, but these signs shall follow the believer. You are a believer. I'm trying to talk to you and stir something up in your life. Where are our exploits? He said, in my name you shall speak with new tongues. In my name, if you eat or drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt you. In my name, you shall cast out devils. In my name, you shall take up serpents. That means you'll be able to handle old Slewfoot. You can put the devil where he belongs. And he said, in my name, you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I'm talking about believers doing exploits. The reason why we do not see the exploits is because our knowledge of Him is limited. But I want you to know you can know Him for yourself. Hallelujah. You can know that you're saved. You can know that you're sanctified. And you can know that you are filled with the Holy Ghost. And then you can be a channel, a vehicle of God's power. That power is on the inside of you. That same Spirit that raised up Christ from the dead, it abides, it dwells within me. Oh, hallelujah. I said it's a resurrecting spirit. Some folks got a spirit that looks dead. But I'm talking about a spirit that you possess that brings life. This is why he said you shall lay hands on the sick. You can transfer that power that you have into the life of another person. You can see a cancer disintegrate. You can see blind eyes open, deaf ears unstop, and the lame walk and leap for joy. Several years ago, I went to Haiti. I've been on radio for hate in Haiti for about 20 years and never went down there to preach. The church that I built in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, underwrote that program. And I never had to ask people for money for that particular station because the church underwrote it. And I was on that station for 20 years, and God spoke to my heart, and he said, Go down there. I want to show you something of how the Word of God is being brought alive in the hearts of the people. I rented the stadium that seated 75,000. Took about $50,000 with us to buy food for the people that couldn't afford food, and we bought beans and rice, and I bought every chicken on the island, and we fed the poor folks. Some of you have sent me an offering for that, and we did what we said we were going to do. But on the opening night of that crusade, I got to tell you this story. There was only 35,000 people in the stadium. But that was beyond my expectations. I never expected that many. But those people listened to that broadcast. The root workers were there, workers of witchcraft. And they came to oppose the meeting. But instead of opposing it, they got saved and delivered and filled with the Holy Ghost. On the opening night of that meeting, I prayed one prayer for those 35,000 people, and I asked God to perform miracles, and the power of God began to fall. My escort came, and he was escorting me outside into the automobile to take me to my hotel after it was over. And a little boy came and grabbed me by the leg and held on, wouldn't turn me loose, so I just dragged him with me. And he was hollering in Creole language. And I can't understand Creole. And the young man that was conveying me to the hotel, he said, Brother Shambach, this guy's trying to tell you something. I said, well, I can't understand it, brother. He says, well, I'll interpret it for you. He said, he's trying to get your attention. Now listen to him. And he said, this little boy said that while you were praying that prayer, he was in the audience. This boy was born blind. 
12 years never saw the light of day. And when you prayed and said the name of Jesus, something happened and the lights came on for the first time in 12 years. God opened his blind eyes. Now, I picked him up and threw him into the arms of one of the pastors. I said, take him up on the platform and let him tell the story. And I went on out. It took about 20 minutes to get out of that crazy stadium. And all of a sudden, about 10 minutes later, I heard the boy talking, and all of a sudden it sounded like somebody scored a touchdown. And I knew he was getting the message across. But what I didn't know, that everybody in Port-au-Prince knew that boy as a little blind boy. And when they heard him testify as to what God did, the next night you couldn't get near the stadium. 75,000 people on the inside, 20,000 outside that couldn't get in because of one miracle. Some years ago I was in St. Kitts down in the Caribbean and there was a school teacher that brought 32 children from a deaf-mute school they were all deaf-mutes. They couldn't hear or speak. And she heard about the miracles that were taking place. And she brought the whole class and lined them on the platform. And I had about 50 preachers on the platform. And I said, preachers, put your fingers in the ears of those deaf folks. Some of them were Baptists. Some of them were Lutheran. Some of them were Methodists. And they were scared to death. I said, you don't have to do nothing. Just put your fingers in the ear and I'll do the praying. But I want to show you, you got something in your life and you're going to put it to work. And those preachers put their fingers in the deaf ears and I prayed and I said, in the name of Jesus, I command the deaf and dumb spirit, come out. I said, now take your fingers out of their ears. And when they did, the whole class began to hear and they started to talk for the first time in their life. I want to let you know you have something. I didn't come to town to tell you you don't have it. You've got it. If you are saved and washed in the blood of the Lamb and filled with the Holy Ghost, you have power. And God expects you to do exploits. And it's time to move out and be a channel of His power. Raise your hands and shout amen with me, somebody. Hallelujah. Following after Him. There has to be a pursuit. You've got to want Him. Not only being sanctified, but I'm talking about being filled with the Holy Ghost. Separated from the world, set apart for God, connotes three things, and to be filled with all the fullness of God. Some of you got the Holy Ghost 20 years ago, but you leaked out. Don't look at me like that. Somebody said, well, I shouted 20 years ago. Yeah, and you lost it 19 and a half years ago. That's why you got to keep coming back for a double portion of the Holy Ghost. To be filled with the Spirit. To be running over brimful experience so that you can be a blessing to somebody else. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And then you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in Judea and then Samaria and then to the uttermost part of the earth. The pursuit. You ask people, have you received the Holy Ghost? Well, no, he didn't give it to me yet. He gave it to you 2,000 years ago. But you got to pursue this thing. you got to be hungry for it. you got to seek his face. And God said, the day that you seek me, you, I shall be found of you. When you seek him, beloved, you can have it. Everything that's in that book that God says you can have, you can have it. But you've got to fight for it. You've got to take every inch of ground from the devil. You've got to be hungry for him and pursue this thing until you are full of the Spirit of God. Raise your hands and shout amen with me. I'm reading from the 11th chapter of Daniel, the latter part of verse 32. The people... But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. The prerequisites for personal power. I believe that down deep in every one of every believer's hearts, there's a desire to heal the sick. 
I can see some of you shaking your heads. You know, I can tell I'm right on, on course right now. There's a desire in your heart to be used of God. To be a channel of His power. I'll never forget when I was a young lad, I'd say, Oh, Lord, let me feel your power so strong that I can just be levitated off the ground about six foot. I'd fantasize about the power of God. I wanted the power of God in my life. I said, Lord, let me lay hands on blind eyes and see them come open. Oh, I wanted to do that so bad. Let me put my fingers in deaf ears and in the name of Jesus command the deaf spirits come out. Bless God, I've seen it happen. I love to lay my hands on sick folks because I like to see them get well. Sometimes I tell folks, I don't care whether you've got any faith or not, i got it tonight. I'm just going to lay hands on you and I know God's going to heal you sure enough. The more folks I, I lay hands on, the more folks I'm going to see well because I have a desire. I have a hunger. I'm in pursuit. I want to know what it is to have that personal power in this life so I can transmit it to somebody else. Oh, hallelujah. But there's more to this. There's more to this if you're going to have this personal power. It's not enough to have a passion for God. But there is a principle of spiritual perception and if you want to find where this is you have to turn over to the book of Ephesians and you'll find it in the book of Ephesians I, I love to read this in Ephesians I don't believe I'm gonna be able to finish this all on one broadcast but if I don't we'll just continue it in the first chapter of Ephesians look at verse first four, uh, verse 15 Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith, this is Paul talking to the church at Ephesus, I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love unto all the saints. I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, listen, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the Spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him there's that word knowledge again wisdom is a spirit the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye may know there's that word know again what is the hope of your calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power how in the world can you do all this in a 15 minute broadcast you just can't do it but this is what I'm talking about receiving that personal power having your eyes open to truth and I want you to know not everybody in the church knows this truth. They don't know it. This is the reason why they're in bondage. And if I can give you an illustration of a woman that was in my church. No, not in my church. She, was, came, in, uh, she came into the meeting to testify. It was a young girl that was dying with tuberculosis. She didn't belong to a full gospel church. She belonged to a church that did not believe in divine healing. And I have no fights with you. If you don't want to believe in divine healing, stay sick. Just don't bother my faith. I, I'm enjoying being well. And I don't want to argue with nobody. If you don't want to believe in it, man, I, I ain't going to fuss with you. But this young girl had tuberculosis and one of her lungs was completely gone. Tuberculosis. And the other lung was half inflated. And the doctors declared she was going to die. Only 17 years of age. She had no future. She had to live in pure oxygen. And her doctor was a Christian. And he didn't believe in divine healing. And he told her, he said, I'm going to send you home to die. And he said, I'm going to tell you you're going to die because you're a Christian. And there is no death to a child of God. To be absent from this body means to be present with the Lord. So he sent her home so she could have her remaining days with her family. 
And there she lay in an oxygen tent, all by herself, breathing pure oxygen in that half of a lung. The other one was dead, waiting for death. She did not have any knowledge of the Word of God concerning healing. Her eyes were blinded to the truth. Like a lot of people that are listening to this broadcast, there's things in the Word of God that are there that you don't even know are there. The Bible says, is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elder of the church. Let him anoint with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he hath committed sin, they shall be forgiven him. Is that what the Bible says? Well, how come you don't do that? When you get sick, you call the doctor. You run off to the hospital. That's not in the Word. Call the elders of the church. Now, if you ain't going to holler amen, holler ouch. And I know I'm treading on some toes anyhow. But this girl was lying there in that bed all by herself reading from Peter's epistle. Himself bear our sins on his, in his body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness. And she laid that Bible down and she began to praise God in her little manner that she could because she didn't have much breath, tears running down her face. And she said, oh Lord, I thank you that I'm saved. Thank you for salvation. Lord, I'm not afraid to die. In fact, she said, I'll be glad to see you, Lord, just to get me out of this mess, and I'll have a brand new body. About ten minutes praising God like that, and she picked the Bible up again. She read it again. Himself bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness. But this time she didn't stop. In the same verse, by whose stripes you were healed. My God, it lit up like a neon sign. And she came to her senses and she said, Oh, Lord, look what I found. This wasn't a theology course. This was no Bible study. All she was doing is reading the Word of God and God opened the understanding of her mind and enlightened her eyes and she said, Look what I found. Now, she's still dying. She, she don't weigh but 57 pounds. And she said, Lord, I just got done praising you for the first part of that verse. Now I'm going to praise you for the second part. And she said, Lord, according to your word, I'm not sick. I'm healed. It says, by your stripes I was healed. I'm not going to say I'm sick no more. I'm just going to thank you for healing my body. She unzipped that thing and hollered for her mama. Mama, come quick! Mama come running upstairs. And she said, what is it, darling? And she had her scrawny legs pulled out over the side of the bed. And she said, what are you doing? She said, Mama, look what I found. Read it. And she gave Mama the Bible and Mama read it. Blah, 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 blah. She said, I read it, honey. Now lay down, please. You're dying now. The daughter read it and got out of bed. Mama read it trying to get her back into bed. The daughter had her eyes open. Mama still got her eyes shut. Are you listening to me? You that believe in divine healing, don't let anybody steal the Word of God out of your heart. God opened your understanding to the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. God healed that girl, and she's still alive today, and gave birth to four children because God took her at her word when she took God at his word. And she got out of that bed completely healed by the power of the living Christ. Hallelujah! You that are listening to this broadcast, God's got a miracle with your name on it. If you can just have your eyes open to the truth so you can receive a miracle in your life. Raise your hands and shout praise the Lord with me. Hallelujah. Reading from the 11th chapter of Daniel. I'm still in that 32nd verse. Looks like I ain't never going to get out of it. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. I finally come to my final point. The principle 
of knowing his word. Brother, if you ever get to the point, sister, if you ever get to the place that you know the word of God, then nobody can put anything on you. Are you listening to me? This is a truth. There's not a devil in hell that can put anything on you when you know that word. This is the most important thing. If you are going to have personal power in your life, then study that word of God. I'm reading from that seventh chapter of 1 Samuel. And I've been using just a portion of this, of this particular 12th verse. He called the name of it Ebenezer. Hitherto, hitherto hath the Lord helped us. Now listen, that same second verse now, I want to stay in that verse just for another few moments. Listen, it came to pass while the ark abode in Kerjath Jearim that the time was long for it was 20 years. Listen, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Not only does God begin the secret for help is desolation, but step number two, it's desperation. They began to lament. I don't care if your church wants revival or not. Get hungry and get desperate and you can bring it yourself. Can you shout amen? I learned this. Get desperate. Oh, I'll tell you, Oh, blind Bartimaeus is my kind of man. I mean, he was desperate, begging for alms. He must have spent a fortune, and doctors couldn't do anything to correct his vision. Somebody stopped him one day and said, Bartimaeus, if you ever find a man coming through town by the name of Jesus, get to him, man. He's a blind man healer. Get to him. And picture Bartimaeus grabbing him by his lapel saying, tell me his name one more time. Name's Jesus, man. Jesus. I'll never forget that name. Jesus. Old Bartimaeus was by that highway side begging for alms when all of a sudden he heard the, thist the rustle of many people rushing by him going into the center of town. Ah, oh, it can't be one of them local politicians. Uh-uh. Democratic convention. Why, they couldn't get a crowd together like that. There's somebody else coming to town. That sure can't be old President Reagan. He can't get no crowd either. My God, who is it coming to our town? He can't find nobody to stop to tell him until he reaches out and catches a hold of a coattail. And he said, who is it? Who's coming to our town? And the man said, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. <laughs> Woo! Are you listening to me? Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Now, he could have been a good church man and said, well, I'll just wait here until he comes by my spot. <laughs> no way. Uh -uh, he couldn't see to get to him, but he pitched his voice in the direction of that noise. And he cried. I said he cried. He got desperate. And he cried, hey, Jesus, have mercy on me. Thou son of David! Call him by his proper name. He didn't stop him. He started crying out. The people come by and put the hand on him and said, Shh, sit, sit down, man. What are you making all that noise in church for? You don't have to make all that noise. That's what a woman told me. She stopped me. She said, you don't have to yell. God ain't deaf. I said, he ain't nervous either, honey, and I got something to holler about. I'm going to shout. <laughs> Hallelujah. Get desperate. Here, Bartimaeus, put this little coin in your, in your cup. Sit down. Stay in that condition you were in. He said, look, I'm the one blind. I'm getting out of this mess. And the Bible said, and I can just picture him throwing that tin cup aside and still had some coins in the thing. He said, I'm sick of being blind. I'm tired of being blind. The blind man healer is here. And the Bible said he cried louder. Hey, Jesus, whoopee, hey, over here, Lord. Ah, get his attention. I 
come to town to tell you he's here. He's walking the aisles. He's walking in and out of them chairs right now. You may not be able to see him, but Jesus is here. How bad do you want this thing? Cry out. Call on him. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Jesus is here. Oh, hallelujah. Get desperate. Oh, you read that. Go back in Mark's gospel and read that story. He was on his way out of town. Nobody got healed. Nobody got blessed. And he was on his way out of town. But Bartimaeus saved the day for him. And when he cried out, the Bible said, Jesus stood still. I can picture him saying, don't tell me somebody got faith in this town. Bartimaeus stopped him and he said to his disciples, go get him and bring him to me. The only desperate one in town. And they come over and said, Bartimaeus, be of good cheer. The master calls for you. Your day of blindnesses are over. From now on, you're going to see. Hear me? I made up my mind. I'm going to be that one. I'm going to cry out for revival. If you want to play church, go ahead and play. I'm going to have revival. If you want to stay sick, stay sick. I'm getting desperate. I'm going to call on the name of the Lord. It's time for deliverance. And it's time to stop him right there where you are. Raise your hands and shout praise the Lord with me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
tell me what's wrong and why you never said you felt that way and guess you're trying to stay strong and fake a smile until i look away but i've known you too long it hurts to watch your blue eyes fade to gray as you fade away Yeah, I'm about to fade away Cause every time I wake up I feel like it's Monday Something's going wrong with all the chemicals up in my brain All of a sudden I don't look at anything the same way Gotta build up of my thoughts sitting in an ashtray I'm sorry that I'm so inconvenient, okay Just let me be me and I'll stay out of your way I can see the way you look at me, I'm such a disgrace I never really asked to be brought into this place You wanna love me? Well then baby, have a taste All the highs and the lows no, you'll never be the same I don't really wanna hurt you But I can't control the pain If you're sticking by my side Maybe we could be okay Okay, okay Maybe you could be the change I need today I promise that I've never felt this way I really hope that you